Today, I'd like to. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for our presentation with Dr. Levin, uh, a primer on diet, food for thought. Uh, real quick, a little bit about Dr. Levin. He is a retired assistant professor of medicine from Ohio State University. For 32 years, he practiced internal medicine in a physician group practice in Columbus, Ohio. At OSU, he focused mainly on hepatology, passing the transplant hepatology boards, and Dr. Levin later redirected his focus from endoscopy suite to outpatient hepatology. Throughout his career, his primary focus was on students, residents, fellows, and postgraduate education. He received teaching awards in 2010 to 2011 and 2015 to 2016 for student teaching. And we are very thankful to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Levin, when you're ready, please begin. Today, I'd like to talk about food. This is a very popular subject. There's a column in the New York Times today on the 10 myths about food. Um, and so and it's been very, very controversial. And the most recent conference, the only consensus was that everyone agreed it wasn't your fault if you were overweight. So I'd like to talk about human diet in general and then go on and, and talk about some of the uh, recommendations that I think are reasonable uh, in this day and age. I have no disclosures. Humans can live and thrive in diets a, a very, that vary from one to the other. And human nutrition requirements have some relatively unusual requirements, however. Humans are extremely vulnerable to waterborne illness. Your dog can drink from a puddle in the road to, and it will do fine. Try it yourself and you'll probably die. My dog, for instance, ate the carcass of a, a squirrel that was probably den, dead 10, 10 days that he found on the street. I tried to pull it from him, but he ate it anyway. What happened to him? Nothing. If you try that yourself, you'll be severely ill. So consequently, humans have had to adapt to make drinking water much safer. In Europe, in the Middle Ages, everybody drank weak beer, even the children. In A History of the World in Six Glasses by Tom Standage, safer drinks such as tea and then coffee were drunk and introduced into Europe. And of course, they used boiled water, which made them so much safer. Now, you have to realize until really uh, the end of the 19th century, um, children died at a very regular rate. So uh, one child in five born in 1870 was uh, dead by the age of five. Um, in 1940, one child uh, in five was dead at the age of 62. And this is not modern medicine. Everybody will tell you it is, but it's actually public health. It's a Pure, Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. All the businessmen said that would be end capitalism as we know it, but Teddy Roosevelt got it through and it made food and drink much safer. The introduction of central heating and and uh, sewage and uh, clean water pi piped into your house. So the introduction of tea dramatically changed the world. Humans cannot synthesize vitamin C. There are about five other animals who can't. All of the, uh, those animals, including humans, ate so much uh, food with vitamin C because they we ate a lot of fruits and vegetables that the loss of the ability to synthesize it was not significant and we were able to thrive even without vitamin C. The problem comes obviously when you stop eating the fruits and vegetables. So we all know about English sailors who got scurvy until limes were uh, uh, on board and that prevented this terrible disease. So one of the questions is what do the Inuit do? People used to be called Eskimos. They avoid scurvy without access to vegetables and fruits high in vitamin C. It ends up that they eat marine animals' lungs, which happens to be a great source of vitamin C. Again, every other species but the R5, like guinea pigs and so forth, synthesize vitamin C. So there was a way around that as well. Um, we have other issues. People who live on flatbread made from wheat may develop heavy metal deficiency like zinc deficiency. Um, wheat has... Um, chemicals called phytates, which chelate heavy minerals like zinc. Leavening destroys the phytates. So in the West, we have leavened bread, whereas in, for instance, Egypt, they have a flat bread. And so many young children, particularly boys, have zinc deficiency and have poor growth and development and poor uh, development of their genitals. Sometimes going from one culture to the other, dietary-wise, can be very problematic. Poor Southerners, particularly black slaves, developed pellagra eating corn gruel. Indigenous inhabitants did not develop pellagra. 
what was the difference? Well, the indigenous peoples made corn tortillas by exposing the corn flour to harsh alkali lime, well, lime, which liberated the niacin. Mere cooking did not. Indigenous people of the Americas were the most innovative agriculturists of the prehistoric world. There's a book called 1491 by Charles Mann who describes this. For every grain of corn planted, eight seeds could be harvested. Barley in Sweden yielded 1.5 grains for every one planted. So obviously it's much more efficient. One of the takeaways from this is just because a product has a nutrient, it doesn't mean it's available to you. So when you read the side of, of a box, I mean, cornmeal can tell you that it has uh, adequate niacin, but it's not available to you. So one of the things, one of the takeaways is reading the nutrients in the side of a package can be totally misleading. And don't take that too seriously. Uh, it, it can be totally wrong. And of course, since Sweden has bad weather, having barley that gives you 1.5 grains per one, it, it really set you up for a horrible recurrent um, starvation. And of course, starvation has been a threat to humankind up to the present with the Ukrainian war and the lack of wheat being delivered to North Africa in their famine and, and uh, drought and floods. So up to the present time, one of the biggest threats to human survival is famine. So of course, it, he, gourd is a human product. It can't reproduce itself. The indigenous people developed this and probably one of the most brilliant agricultural achievements ever. In Peru, for instance, I saw a plot with corn, squash, and beans growing without laying fallow for over a thousand years. The nitrogen fixation of the beans put nutrients that the corn and squash needed in the soil and allowed this perpetual growing season. The introduction of agriculture is called the greatest disaster in human history by Jared Diamond in Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, the archaeologists can show you that human height dropped six inches when compared to their hunter-gatherer ancestors, although maybe this is a bit of hyperbole. Again, up till 2022, famine remains a great threat. Now in 2023, Humans in Southeast Africa may have numbered a few hundred of the nadir of total population thousands of years ago before the migration to other continents. I will not discuss special diets of food allergies, fennel ketone union, or maple syrup disease, or diabetes at this time. What is our diet feeding us and our microbiome? Our microbiome consumes and generates nutrients, affects inflammation, signals of the brain, and the rest of the body, and may make the difference to life or death of the host. Um, there's an investigator, Balfour Santor at the University of North Carolina, who uh, did, uh, was a world expert in this area and, and thought that the microbiome was useless and only harmful. It's amazing how he turned around. He trained and, and educated a the vast majority of, of advanced scientists in this area. And he himself has become um, a, a very pro prolific scientist in his very advanced age on the effect the microbiome has on our health. Germ-free animals are sickly, have poor, poorly differentiated intestines and fail to provide nutrients and fail to defend the intestinal wall. So what is the ideal diet you and your patients should be eating? Well, there isn't one, except when you're an infant. Mother's breast milk for the first six months is ideal if available. Obviously not all women can breastfeed. Vaginal delivery contributes, contributes to the proper micro, uh, microbiome to the infant. However, recent studies show that even without vaginal delivery, mothers impart much of the infant's microbiome everywhere over several months. It's interesting, some women uh, OBs who need a C-section will take a smear from their own vagina and smear it across the infant's mouth. There's no controlled trial to show that works, but it certainly makes sense as far as I can see. The term balanced diet to me has no useful meaning because everybody has a different interpretation. And my foodie friends who have taken several cooking classes in Italy tell me that they have no idea, that people in Italy have no idea what a Mediterranean diet is. And having been to several Mediterranean countries like Spain and Northern Italy, what we would think of as a Mediterranean diet is not what they eat. So I don't think that's a terribly good label. But we, so we'll for, focus really on the constituents of eating, the timing, availability, and preparation of the food to meet the individual's need. Um, so many of the diets are recommended, um, and um, one Harvard endocrinologist discouraged by the poor results of patients on the diabetic diet, suggested without evidence that the keto diet should be used. 
I agree that the a diabetic diet is obsolete, but the keto diet recommendation is out of the frying pan into the fire. This makes another important point. People are always extrapolating from their experience. And the trouble with diets is you really have to do control trials on a population of people. It can be very, very difficult to predict what will happen. The low fat diet for most people is a poor diet since it's too high in carbohydrates and sometimes in protein. If you get too much protein, it has to be deaminated into carbohydrates and toxic nitrogenous waste. Dietary studies are extremely difficult to do unless you have people on a metabolic ward. There was an Israeli study done in a factory in the Negev desert. What was good about it is that every employee ate the big meal of the day, lunch, at the factory, and they could control the noon meal, and they were able to show modestly dependable results uh, and the advantage of, uh, you know, of a, a, a plant-based diet. A short-term study of obese children, just 10 days, in a metabolic ward did show that isochloric substitution of starch for fructose resulted in a 7.2% drop in liver fat as measured by magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And uh, this is in, it was published in 2017. And there are many reasons why fructose uh, um, is so toxic, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Post-myocardial infarction studies done in the Mediterranean area, actually Southern France, um, compared the DASH diet with the Mediterranean diet and claimed the Mediterranean diet was better. But when you really analyzed it, um, participants often cheated because the Mediterranean diet tastes a whole lot better. But I think there's several diets that you could label Mediterranean or similar. But the best thing in my view about the Mediterranean diet is it's very palatable, at least for those of us who like that kind of food. But there are at least three other diets that are primarily vegetable that are just as effective. And it depends on what you like to eat and where you, you know, where you grew up, what your mom made, all those things will determine your taste. So what do we, why do we have such problems with rising obesity and lower life expectancy? Um, it's very difficult to study this. First of all, we have very poor tools. Calories, that concept was just calculated in the 19th century by American government scientists. Well, it's a terrible way of measuring the effect of food because incinerating food to see how much the process raises the temperature of a cubic centimeter of water is not how the human digestive tract or human physiology works. So we talk about calories in, calories out. We don't really know what that means. Even worse is the BMI. The BMI was developed by Adolf Kudele, a Belgian polymath, who was used to, to determine famine in the 1830s Europe. And between, 18, between 1760 and 1850, Europe suffered what they call the Little, Little Ice Age. It got much colder. In 1883, Krakatoa Quack, blew up, and that really caused difficulties because it blocked the rays of the sun. And, you know, it snowed in July in uh, the United States and in Europe. So famine became a real problem. So he developed the BMI as a population tool to look for famine, not obesity. Everybody uses this thing to, to, to identify obesity. That was never its intent. Plus, he made the point that it should never be used for individuals, that it should only be used for populations. So he's looking for famine. He was looking at a Caucasian European population, and he said, don't use it on individuals. So what happened? Well, Ansel Keys, he was the guy who invented the K-rations in World War II, which is why they call them K-rations was a um, nutritionist at the University of Minnesota. And he suggested without evidence that um, we should use the BMI to, to identify obesity. And President Eisenhower's cardiologist, Dr. Paul Dudley White, not a scientist, agreed. And that was it. No confirmatory trial, no studies to show that it was really valid. And so if you read the guidelines, they say the normal BMI for Caucasians is 25. They say for South Asians, it's 23. Actually, in South Asians, it's 19. So when the FDA um, demands that you have a BMI of a certain range to be treated with semaglutide, for instance, for obesity, it, it's really prejudiced against the South Asians in this country who are metabolically um, similar to Caucasians uh, with a BMI of 25. Uh, that alone is, I think, is a, is a terrible 
policy. The distribution of weight is very helpful in assessing risk, however. First of all, you want to examine the abdomen. There are really three layers of fat in the abdomen. And so you, what you have to do is, number one, look at the abdomen. Number two, you have to measure it. One of the best things to do is take a tape measure and measure the circumference just above the hip bone in expiration. That will give you a lot of information. Second of all, give the uh, abdominal wall a pinch. If you have a lot of fat in the subcutaneous area, that's metabolically neutral. That's not a real problem. There are things that allow you to look inside. An MR is a good way of looking. And there are two layers of fat in the intra-abdominal. One is more superficial and has less of a metabolic effect. It's the visceral fat that surrounds the organs that's most involved in causing um, glucose intolerance, fatty liver, and so forth. So you can actually identify that. The other thing that's important to realize is that the fat in the butt and legs is not a factor. We all know that you know muscular men, football players, and so forth can have a BMI of 40 and still have 2% body fat. It ends up that we, women with large butts and thighs um, can have a BMI 30% higher than normal, that's above 30, and still be metabolically normal because the fat in the butt and the thighs is not uh, gonna be harmful. Uh, and so that's an important issue uh, to consider. So where the fat is, is very important. And the only way you're going to find out is by examining the patient. The, the scale won't tell you. Um, you have to actually examine the patient. Um, I liked, I, when I was in practice, we toured the grocery store with medical students and with patients to help them look to, to see what kinds of foods to, you can f find and, and what you can afford to eat. But one of the problems with healthful foods is they're much more expensive than the hyper-refined uh, stuff that we eat that makes us sick. And so eating properly is more expensive and often a limiting factor. And foods deserts are particularly a problem because they magnify the issue. If you can't buy fruits and vegetables in your neighborhood, uh, that's an issue. And we, remember, we eat food, not nutrients. Again, reading the side of the label doesn't really help you. If you go to a dietitian who says, read the side, get another dietitian. Supplements do not look, work like food. For instance, calcium supplements can cause vascular calcification where high calcium foods such as milk or cheese do not do that. Again, don't believe your dietitian if they emphasize the label in the package. Just like that problem with um, um, nutrients such as um, um, the um, pellagra and uh, niacin, Niacin, you may have niacin on the label, but it doesn't mean that your body can absorb it. So it does you no good at all. So what do we really know? What do you yourself and what to recommend to your patients? First of all, take a good dietary history. Uh, I learned a lot by shadowing a great dietitian and markedly improved my dietary history. Dr. Che at the University of Michigan, for instance, makes his fellows do that also. What I learned, don't ask people what they eat because they lie. You say, what did you have for breakfast on Monday? What did you have for dinner on Tuesday? That kind of thing. This will give you a much better idea because people will tell you they eat fruits and vegetables. And it's, you know, every al alternative uh, Good Friday, they give it, they eat something. So you want to, to, to quantitate it. If, before you start somebody on a change of diet, you have to find out if they want to do it. This is a shared decision. Just to pontificate to somebody isn't going to help. Um, and and sometimes I, I found that it was often a problem that the person didn't know how to cook or had nobody in the house that knew how to cook. And I actually sent many people to cooking class. And one woman showed up with her and her husband like a year later, so proud of themselves because, I mean, he had, she had lost 30 pounds and he had lost like 40 because she went to cooking class, learned how to cook. Um, learned, we had taught her how to buy and it really worked like a charm. So there are some people who um, you can correct their sheer ignorance and have a dramatic long-term effect. Again, it's a matter of choice. I've had patients with known celiac disease who refuse to go on a gluten-free diet. And again, you can't make them, that's, that's their choice. You do wanna avoid highly refined manufactured foods. They're designed for long shelf life. 
I have one cookie a day, a Tate's cookie. And I honestly, I think if I opened the package and somebody came back a hundred years later, the, the cookies would still be, still be uh, um, uh, wholesome and, and not stale. They've been designed for very long shelf life uh, because that's, that's helpful. They've also been designed to entice people to eat way too much. Uh, they, they're not satiating because that's how you sell more food. Their ingredients tend to damage the microbiome, microbiome and cause leaky gut with emulsifiers. And then they lack in two intact food structures that add to their safety. Um, many of the, uh, the ingredients, um, uh, like that's what makes ice cream, you know, fancy ice cream very smooth, things like that. And those have been shown to break down the barrier in the intestine and let a lot of these toxic materials in, which then damage the liver, for instance. Generalizing about food is very difficult. For instance, my former boss <clears throat> had a child with type 1 diabetes. He monitored the child 24 hours a day on his phone. One morning, he was very upset because her glucose was 210. That's bad. If your glucose is above 200 in your exercise, you're so, you have so much insulin resistance that uh, the exercise will actually drive the sugar up. If it's below 200, it'll go down. So I asked her what, she, what the child had had for breakfast, and he said that she had oatmeal. And I guess it's instant, yep. I suggested they try old-fashioned. With the old-fashioned, her glucose was 170. <clears throat> and that, again, is great because that's where you want it, and that will drop with exercise. My son-in-law used to work at a Quaker, and he confirmed my observation, saying nuggets work no better than the old-fashioned. But if you look at the package, the instant and old-fashioned look the same. So what's the point here? The point here is that the physical structure of the material is very important and tends to be ignored. We, we generally look at the chemistry and not the physics. It's been known for over half a century, for instance, that Miller's brand is very laxating. Um, I used to put it on my cereal when I was a GI fellow, you know, being dedicated to the field. And it certainly helps you go. If you take that very same brand and grind it up like pumice, it's actually constipating. So there was, for instance, in the New York Times, an article on fiber, and they talk about the various fibers. And you can't equate the fiber in something like Swiss Moesley, which is almost unprocessed wheat and oats, with the whole grain fiber you'll have in whole wheat bread. First of all, most whole wheat bread is diluted somewhat with regular um, white flour because uh, whole wheat bread is all whole wheat. It's pretty hard to choke down. But second of all, the process of breaking it down changes the structure and changes its effect on your digestive tract, on your microbiome, and so forth. So again, the, the physical structure is very important. It's not um, generalizable. In fact, old-fashioned oatmeal is a pretty ideal breakfast, particularly if you add fruit and nuts like walnuts. A good diet, whatever you call it, prescribes added fructose in food and candies, but fructose in, 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 uh, is fine in intact fruit like berries. Now, many of the berries have very little fructose. For instance, blueberries have very little. But the, the, the reason is that the rapid absorption of fructose is what causes difficulty. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, whereas it, if it's in fruit, it slows things down amazingly and has very little effect, very little negative effect on the, on the metabolism. So a diet should include a lot of raw vegetables. Um, as Pollen said, you want to eat food, not much, mostly, mostly vegetables. And that is, is absolutely true. Both raw and cooked, canned, so forth, are very good. More important than fruit, uh, fish is very good. And people will say, what about uh, mercury? And what about contamination? Those are issues. And the safest fish are really smaller um, ocean-going fish. Big ocean-going fish have a lot of uh, mercury. <coughs> and fruit and fish in fresh water are more likely to be contaminated with, with uh, chemicals you don't want to be eating. Processed meat should be eaten, eaten very infrequently, and red meat maybe once a week. The diet, one of the things that people talk about is a percentage of 
the diet that ought to be fat. And it used to be 10%, now people are going up to 40%. But this week, as I was reviewing this, I came to an epiphany, which is the percentage of the fat in the diet doesn't really make much sense. For instance, if you're on a diet that includes 20% fat, and it's your birthday, and you go out and eat a lot of carbohydrates, you have a big birthday cake and so forth, the goal is not to eat more fat to catch up so you get to the 20%. It's how much you're eating. You don't have to increase that. So I don't like the, the percentage. I mean, people always look at the dietary studies and Crete and other places like that where people live forever and they have 20% fat, but they don't eat that much. It, they eat enough. You don't have to eat more if you eat more calories. So I think that um, that's terribly misleading. I think in general, as a rule of thumb, you should try to avoid um, uh, you know, red meat and processed meat um, but obviously avoiding an impossible, probably number one is not feasible. Number two is probably not necessary. You can splurge once in a while. I always used to tell people on Saturday night, they can eat whatever they want. My story about the um, N of one, again, demonstrates the fact that the physical property can be very important. Um, and uh, we've already discussed that. What about the good fats? There, there are a lot of bad fats. And um, bad fats are trans fats. Trans fats were very popular after World War II because they lasted forever. They stabilized things. And they're artificial, they're hydrogenated. And they end up being very bad for coronary disease. Um, the... Um, Naturally occurring uh, omega-3 fats and non-animal are helpful and they're found in a lot of vegetable products. Um, the animal fat, like in lard and stuff like that, is a problem. Now, animals have different amounts of saturated fat. Cattle eat unsaturated fat in the form of grass. But unfortunately, their microbiome in their ruminant stomachs will... Um, um, saturate the fat so that virtually all the fat in um, beef um, is saturated. If you look at hogs, they have a much more unsaturated fat and it probably is safer. And certainly with poultry, it's much safer because they have a lot of unsaturated fat. You can kind of tell that because trans fats are solid at room temperature, whereas chicken fat, we, we used to call schmaltz, is semi-liquid at room temperature. So one of the reasons poultry is safer is because um, it, it has less saturated fat. What about cholesterol? Cholesterol is a, a, another thing that's really funny. Uh, when I got into medical school that, that uh, winter, my father took me to a medical society meeting in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Some old guy was sitting there reading and he starts saying about eggs that have cholesterol, you shouldn't eat eggs. So for decades, I personally didn't eat very many eggs. Eggs do have a lot of cholesterol. They have very little fat, and they're otherwise probably very good for you. Well, somebody actually bothered to do a study, and guess what? The cholesterol in eggs does not raise the cholesterol in most people. Some people, small percentage, yes, but not in most people, as long as you have moderate intake, like seven or eight eggs a week. So when I think of all the eggs I didn't eat that should have that I should have eaten, it's really sad. Um, again, just because it's in the food substance doesn't mean it's harmful to you. This thing with eggs is a good example. So I think that eggs are uh, very good. And I, of course, right now you can't afford them because of bird flu. But uh, I don't think they have to be prescribed in everybody. What about flax seeds, walnuts, canola oil, and soybean oil? I think those are uh, terrific. Um, and personally, I have uh, probably 10 or 15 walnut halves in my cereal every morning. Uh, and uh, we use a lot of other vegetable oils. Monosaturated oils are present in olives and peanuts and canola oil. And um, particularly extra virgin olive oil seems to be very helpful. We personally have avocados almost every day. And so I'm a big fan of using these kinds of oils, which taste good. Uh, and seem to be helpful for you. The, um, and there are a lot of vegetable oils that are, are really pretty good for you. So again, the higher 
omega-3 fats are associated with a lower risk of premature death. I should add that these dietary changes aren't going to double your life expectancy. I mean, you'll get a few more years out of it. Uh, you'll probably be healthier. But again, it's not it's not going to make you live forever. You're, just, you're, you're not going to become Methuselah. So uh, it, it, it's helpful uh, and cuts down on a lot of disease, but you know nobody lives forever. Now, replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat does lower the, the risk. Um, and in 2022, a Lancet report that showed that higher fat Mediterranean diet in people with coronary artery disease decreased the subsequent MIs by 22% compared to a lower fat Mediterranean diet. That is, the vegetables were the same, but they added more um, of the uh, 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 unsaturated fats, which are much better for you. Again, avoid trans fats. They raise the LDL, drop the HDL. If you're interested in references, Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health Nutrition Source has a lot of information on, on that kind of stuff. Now, a pure vegetarian diet is fine, but you do require B12 supplements. We didn't evolve on a vegetarian diet. A lacto-vegetarian diet can be very nutritious and satisfying. Interestingly enough, when you study milk, even reduced fat milk, it, it is the fat is associated with increased disease. If you just look at cheese up to maybe an ounce and a half a day, that's not so. And again, what may be different is that the fat in cheese, which has been fermented, it becomes um, surrounded by a micelle. And so it may have a different pattern of absorption and, and, um, and uh, digestion and seems to have far less impact on cholesterol. So go ahead and eat your uh, cheese. It's a lot safer than you thought it was. Again, extra virgin olive oil, I think is great. Uh, I'm a big fan of California because it's cheapest and safest. Uh, they've had a olive oil, olive tree blight in, in, in Italy. So a lot of the Italian oil is actually grown from uh, olives in Greece and they cheat a lot. They put other oils in there that are not uh, extra virgin uh, olive oil. So um, caveat emptor. Uh, of course, I can't convince me, even my wife to, to, to buy American uh, olive oil for whatever reason, probably just out of spite. But this, you, know, you can get a bottle for six bucks, it's much cheaper and it tastes okay. I also think you probably want to get um, olive oil that's um, fresh. You can tell if it's fresh because if you put a drop on your tongue, if it take, tastes sort of um, sharp and astringent, then that's uh, um, fresh. If, if you put it on your tongue and you, all you do is taste oil, it's old. So I think the, and again, we're not 100% sure why the olive oil is so good. It may not be even the olive oil, maybe the other materials that come from the olive. So I'm a big fan in, in using fresh olive oil, the most dependable being American. Diet should be rich in whole grains, you know, olive oil, as we've mentioned, cooked in raw vegetables with fruit for dessert. And again, vegetables are more important than fruit. Avoid as much as you can white rice, white potato, and white bread. White rice is diabetogenic. Interesting enough, brown rice is not. Try convincing your Asian patients of that. They won't listen. And that's one of the reasons why Asians have such a high uh, prevalence of um, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, because of their uh, dependence on white rice. Article in the paper today in the New York Times says white potatoes are fine. Uh, I remain unconvinced. I think that uh, that you're much better off. Even something like a sweet potato, for instance, is much more healthful for you. Now, how do you get children to eat vegetables? Well, Alice Waters owned the restaurant Chez Parnis, which really was the origin of California cuisine. She's a brilliant woman. And what she did is she pioneered in the process of setting up gardens in inner, inner city youth in uh, San Francisco and other places. And the fact is children will eat what they grow. You can't get a kid to eat um, a cucumber unless that kid ate, grew the cucumber. And it works like a charm. I can only tell you from personal experience, when uh, we moved to Hartford from New York, um, we lived in um, a two-story house that was part of my great-grandfather's estate. He'd been dead for a long time, but the estate hadn't been closed. And next to it, they had an empty lot. My dad uh, paid to have it plowed, and we shared the lot with the owner of the uh, lot. 
and we grew all kinds of corn and cabbage and stuff like that. And, you know, as a three-year-old, I was assigned uh, things like pulling the um, worms off the cabbage and so forth. And trust me, when you do that, you will eat what you grow. You're proud of it. And I would strongly encourage every family who has the access to a place where you can grow uh, vegetables to do that with your kids. It'll markedly improve their willingness to try to eat these things. Again, remember being overweight is not um, the patient's fault. There are a lot of reasons. Eating less and exercising will not necessarily result in weight loss. It is, people like fasting. There's very little evidence that prolonged fasting helps very much actually. But it is true that every, things you eat in the morning cause less weight gain than things you eat in the evening. So ideally, like our agricultural forebears, eat a big breakfast, work your butt off, eat a bigger lunch, work your butt off, and then you have a small dinner. We used to call it supper, which is a, a modest evening meal. But that's not how we live. Unfortunately, um, we get up, we have to swallow breakfast, we go, can't eat much for lunch because you fall asleep at work. And, and that's a really difficult situation. I would proscribe foods that are sugared with fructose. High fructose corn syrup is a very common sweetener in this country, and it comes from corn, obviously. Fructose is a six carbon sugar with a five carbon ring. And that five carbon ring structure probably makes it difficult for, gly for uh, glycogen to store fructose. It is stored in the fat, particularly in the liver, and causes insulin resistance and ultimately type two diabetes. Fructose in fruits is so slowly absorbed that this doesn't really cause a problem. And what proteins work, again, fish we talked about, poultry, uh, eggs are probably okay for, for the reason we talked about. So what about obesity? Again, diet and exercise may not help. If any of you saw their show, The Biggest Loser, you remember that they took very obese people, you know, had them diet aggressively and exercise until they were ready to drop dead, and they lost a lot of weight. But if you look after the show, virtually everybody regained weight. And up to six years after the program, the metabolic rate was still slow. Why is that? Again, that's because of the threat of famine up to the present time. When the body senses a great deal of weight reduction, it will drop the metabolic rate to try to keep you from dying. We have a muscle, we have an enzyme in muscle called myostatin, which makes your muscles shrink away when you don't exercise. So the body does a lot of things to cut the, the required calories to survive. If you're a lion, you don't have myostatin because of a a, a line with small muscles can't earn a living. So this is sort of a human phenomenon. So one of the things you want to do is when you lose weight, you want to do it slowly over a long period of time. That's why when you put somebody on a quote diet, unquote, it's really not a temporary thing. It's a lifestyle change. So darn well better be tolerable and palatable. Now, there are medications that are very promising. Semaglutide seems very promising. People lose a lot of weight. They do have some side effects. Uh, everybody talks about it, the GLP and uh, agonists and so forth. Truthfully, I think the major reason they work is they cause gastroparesis, and so you you, you feel full. Um, so uh, that should be considered. Uh, Trisepatide, which I'll mention in the next slide, is even more promising. Although I'd like to see what happens. I do think that a dietitian can help, and classes are fine. You don't have to be one on one, and I'd like to see patients for short visits frequently because it provides motivation. Um, and again, consider the GLP-1 agonists. Um, there is a, a very good um, YouTube presentation by the dietitian I listed here. She's an Israeli. Again, Terzeptide is GIP and GLP receptor agonist and is even more effective. Again, I'd like to see some results before I highly recommend it for everybody. In 60 Minutes, there were doctors from Harvard, one of the Brigham and one at Mass General, and the Mass General doctor blamed obesity on genetics, saying 85% of people who are obese have obese parents. I can't buy that myself, because when you look at movies from 1900, everybody was skinny. It is true that if your mother is obese when she is pregnant with you, epigenetics will kick in. In other words, her metabolic situation will alter the metabolism of the fetus forever. So you're sort of doomed to obesity if your mom was fat. It's amazing how many pregnant women, women who are delivering babies, have fatty liver in our country now. Women, of course, are much older than they used to be, and we're all heavier. And so this is really a, a real problem. Um, I do think 
um, that families live together, eat together. So everybody is happy. They probably share it. It was interesting. There's a study from the, from the Framingham study at Harvard, which is done by the Harvard School of Public Health, and showed that obesity is almost like an infectious disease. If all your friends get fat, you'll get fat too. You won't be inhibited. Um, and it, it really sort of behaves um, as if it, it, it's a contagion. So I think that if your friends are thin, heck, get thin friends, it'll help you keep from gaining weight. The heavy friends will get you out to eat, eat a lot of pizza, stuff like that. So it is important whom you hang around with. And finally, <clears throat> David Ludwig at Boston Children's Hospital uh, had a very interesting, has done some very interesting studies showing that hyperinsulinemic spikes play a very important role in fatty liver and obesity. Rapidly absorbed carbohydrates, those are the ones in sugar drinks and things like that, as opposed to slowly ones, slowly absorbed ones, which are stuck in your blueberry or your raspberry or something like that. They cause a high insulin spike, which drives the carbohydrates to be incorporated in fat, and particularly fat in the liver, and contrary to expectations, diminishes the beta cell ability to produce and secrete insulin. Um, this is really consistent um, with what we know, because we know that many obese type two diabetics, particularly men, have what we call sarcopenia. They have small muscles. So in, in a rodent model, this hyperinsulinemia will cause so much of the uh, sugar to be driven into the fat that it starves the muscles. So the muscles become atrophied and the rest of it becomes fat. This is exactly what we observe in obese type two diabetic men. Um, so uh, again, the fructose in your food is slowly absorbed where it is if it's, if it's in a sugar drink. For instance, orange juice is bad for you. Oranges are fine for you. Among other things, there's several um, oranges that contribute to the uh, orange juice you drink in the morning in one glass. So there's more of the juice, but more than that, the uh, process of breaking it down and slowing it down keeps the, the level from going up and, and prevents that insulin spike. So high fat diet is pro-inflammatory. Again, I'm not a big fan of the percentage when I think about how they calculate it, um, but I do think that at least if you have an you know, isochloric diet, you're, you're not heavy. 15 or 20 percent is, is probably fine. Again, the semi-glutide. Um, I did ask uh, when I went to a webinar on, on obesity uh, about using uh, beta colic acid if you're trying to get people to lose weight. Um, weight loss causes a marked increase in bile cholesterol um, concentration and becomes hypersaturated and tends to cause gallstones. And for instance, if people have gastric bypass surgery, something like that, we tend to put them on a better colic acid. And the expert from Penn said, no, you got to be careful. Don't have them lose that much weight. However, studies on, ter uh, uh, on the semi-glutide and terbesticide have shown that um, something like 8 or 10% of people on these develop gallstones, whereas none developed in the control group. So I still would put people on a beta colic acid, 250 milligrams, two or three times a day while they're in the process of losing weight to prevent gallstones. So if there are any questions? Thank you, Dr. Levin, this was great. Um, all right, Dr. Mazzullo, I'm going to allow you to talk. Please feel free to, to unmute yourself and you can talk directly with Dr. Levin. Dr. Levin, that was just absolutely wonderful. I'm a primary care doctor from Tufts, which is right in the middle of Chinatown. And I spent a lot of time trying to teach my patients to uh, eat brown rice, but I found out why they won't. I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but in China, if you're rich and you're, you're high society, you eat white rice because rice, you can get to a mill if you eat brown rice, you're a peasant, and it's a, it's almost like garbage. It's not something you're supposed to eat, which is kind of interesting because German bread is leaden and very heavy, uh, but in the high class society, they eat milled wheat to because to, to get to a mill, they had to be fancier. Do you think that makes any sense? Oh, absolutely. But actually, the same thing happened in Europe. 
uh, there's a really good book um, by Ferdinand Boudel. He was a French historian. It's called The Structure of Everyday Life. And he talks what, about what life was like uh, in the Middle Ages in Europe. And for instance, the typical French peasant ate 2,000 calories of black bread. And he talked about what happened during famine. They, they prevented, they, they outlawed um, white flour because white flour obviously lost some of the nutrients in the, in the, in the milling. So th th this, this prestige thing is not isolated to, to, um, to uh, the Orient. It was true in Europe as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's, it's, it's an affront to them. You're absolutely right. Personally, we have brown rice all the time, but they know it's not an issue for us. You know, we can, we can afford whatever we want to eat, but you're absolutely right. That's a real barrier. Great. Um, if you have a question, remember you can uh, use the raise hand feature or you can type your question into the Q&A box. Um, I don't see any questions right now. So I'll take this opportunity to remind you that if you think of a question after the fact, you can always use the VC platform and um, send in a, a consult to Dr. Levin or any of our Maven Project volunteers. Um, any questions that you have? So, well, I, I just want to, if there are no questions, I just want to comment that I have been a victim of all these things, just like everybody else. And when the high, the low fat diet was promulgated, um, I went on a low fat diet and I got really big and fat. It's amazing how fat you can get on a low fat diet. And uh, it was when I decided to, to co correct that, uh, I decided on a very long time course. This is before I knew about the, the biggest loser, but just made more sense. And I looked at my own sins, which were portion control and grazing at night. And I really cut out the, you know, added back the, the healthful fats and so forth. and was able to lose 30 pounds and, and I've kept it off for several years. And it's not painful. Now I will, there's a proviso when you're older, it's often easier to lose weight. It just is. Um, so I've, I've been a victim of this as well. I, I can remember eating Frookies cookies. You can eat a pound of them without being satisfied. There's no satiation from that. So I know what, what it's like to go through. We do have a question. Um, can you comment on the malbosorption of gastric bypass surgery and the lack of restrictions of fats? Yeah, I think that... Um, the um, mechanism of action of gastric bypass surgery, and they talk about malabsorption, I think that's really not very important. Um, there are heavy metals that are absorbed in the duodenum, like zinc and copper and things like that. So you have to be very careful that you supplement those things in people with gastric bypass. But that's not how it works. Lee Kaplan at, at, at Mass General has been doing studies in this forever. It, it, it just suppresses your appetite, your stomach is smaller. Um, it does not cause significant malabsorption. Um, you know, the intestinal bypasses and stuff like that. They, we, when I was a fellow, we did a fair number of adjacent ileal bypasses and that was really good at killing people. Um, they developed liver failure, they lost weight and then they regained it. So yes, you can cause liver failure because of this crazy surgery but they don't see, you don't see that with, with gastric bypass. The troubles you have with gastric bypass include, you know, um, um, an, an astomotic ulcers and cramps and pain and obstruction and all these other wonderful things. But uh, the surgeons always talk about it as being malabsorptive and it really isn't except for those heavy metals that are absorbed sp specifically in the duodenal suite. So you gotta, you know, make sure you have enough zinc and copper and, and things like that. Um, for vegetarians, how do they know that they have the necessary nutrition nutrients other than B12? Well, you know, it's easier than you might think because if you eat um, um, vegetables that that um, have uh, protein, like beans, legumes, nuts, all those things, you, you'll get just about everything you need. Plus, yeah, of course, you have to take the B12, but that's about it. So, you know, most of us, when we, when we eat things like that, um, we'll be satisfied. Um, so just make sure that you include 
uh, legumes and nuts and other things like that that are loaded with, with protein. People talk about vegetable proteins as being incomplete proteins. My dad used to talk about that all the time. It ends up it's not true. All 20 amino acids are present in vegetables. And so you can do just fine. Just But you're, again, you you got to pick the ones that uh, like nuts, legumes, beans, et cetera, that have a fair amount. Wheat has a fair amount. Uh, oats have a fair amount. Um, so it's it's not really that hard to do. Wonderful. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. So thank you all for joining us today. And Dr. Levin, thank you for putting together such a comprehensive uh, slide deck. It was, I always Thanks. enjoy yep. uh, your, your, your tidbits and uh, pearls on olive oil and things what to eat. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Have a great day, everyone.